You're listening to Miss Style, Strength, and Grace with Deidre Murphy. This is your one-stop shop for style, fashion, health, and fitness. Deidre's passion is to help empower women to reach their fullest potential, both inside and out. Deidre and her guests will be discussing how to develop your style, health, and lifestyle hacks to energize your day and inspire you to keep reaching higher levels of success. Deidre is a professional fashion stylist, health guru, and Mrs. Washington 2017. It's time to get open and honest with Deidre. Hello, listeners. Today, I am super eager to share my interview with Annie Spano. Annie is the founder and CEO of Style Collective, which is the largest online platform for influencer community and education and support. With her degree in mathematics education and an MBA, she also has several years experience in corporate marketing at a $3 billion global company where she helped grow the retail division through her roles in product development, marketing, and merchandising. After starting her own personal blog and realizing that influencers needed help navigating the emerging industry of influencer marketing, Annie opened up the doors to Style Collective in order to help facilitate authentic connections and provide industry-leading educational content for influencers. In today's episode, Annie and I talked about not only her leaving the corporate world and corporate America, but also why she took that leap of faith in order to start her own blog, monetize her own direct sales company, and thus start Style Collective. My hope is that you are inspired by hearing her stories and her way of creating authentic relationships in order to really start living in your own truth, to find your passion, and as she would say, live your life with purpose and authenticity. So I hope you enjoy today's show as much as I enjoyed interviewing Annie. Thank you so much for having me on this show today, Deirdre. I'm so excited to connect. I loved that uh, you would DM me on Instagram, and we really got to know each other over the last couple of months. And and then when you joined, I was like, oh my God, yay, this is exciting. <laughs> well, it's funny, as, as I listen to a lot of your podcasts, it seems like a lot of your interviews with other guests are people that you've met even via social media too. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people that I interview, I've never met before. Oh, that's And that, it's usually my fir- first time like ever talking to them is right before we podcast. <laughs> Like, like right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's amazing how much the technology in our world can really connect us, even though you're all the way over in, you're in North Carolina, right? Raleigh? Yeah. Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. Yep. I keep thinking New Hampshire, but that's where you were at before. That's so. where I was before. Yes. I lived there for seven years. And then previous to that, I was in, I grew up in New York and I lived in New Jersey for a little bit with my husband after college. And that's where I taught high school math. But yeah, kind yeah. of been all over the Oh my gosh. Well, that kind of actually starts me off into my first little question. Why don't you give our listeners a little brief overview of what you do now, both as the founder of Style Collective and give us a little average day in the life of Annie. (laughs) Sure. So being the founder of Style Collective means that I literally do everything. <laughs> I do the content creation. I have I maintain customer relationships. So like you and I talking right now on the podcast, I try to um, have personal relationships with as many girls as I can that are part of Style Collective. I also have my team that I manage. I build and execute on the strategy for the future of Style Collective and how to grow it and keep it relevant and keep offering value to everyone as this industry continues to grow and change. Um, There's a lot of focus on retention within the business being a subscription model. It's like, how do we keep people around? What do they, we keep giving them that's of value? And then at the same time, doing acquisition as well, finding new people that are interested in Style Collective and then getting them to join. And then also staying on top of the ever-changing industry of influencer marketing and making sure that everything is up to date and relevant and we're on top of it. So every every day is different. I wouldn't say like the only thing like an average day looks like for me is that I have the same morning routine where I wake up sometime between either 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. It just depends on um, how much work I have and if I get actually get to bed between like eight and nine the night before. 
So I always wake up between five and six. I head to the gym, which I know that's something that we have in common. We always work out. (laughs) Uh, And then come home, make a green smoothie with my husband. We drink coffee. We do our five-minute journal. And then figure out what we're going to do for the day, set the priorities. (laughs) You're drinking your smoothie right now. (laughs) So funny. So the, the beginning of my day is always the same. It starts with the gym and my smoothie and coffee, my five minute journal, spending some time with my husband. We both work from home, but we go into separate offices and sometimes we don't even see each other all day long because he's on the phone all day long or I'm just locked in here and I'm like working on so many things. And before I know it, it's five (laughs) o'clock and we haven't (laughs) seen each other. So, but other than that, like my day varies. Sometimes it depends on what I'm working on and I keep everything organized in this program called Trello. It's an online program and it has boards and you can add your tasks to it and assign it to team members. And so that helps me stay organized and on task. Ooh, I might have to look into that because sometimes I feel like I'm all over the place. We have that in common as far as being like female entrepreneurs and you have a bigger team than I do. So I'm in, in like, ah, oh, but it still sounds like you do a lot. I'm like, wow, hashtag winning and boss babe over here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it's busy. a lot of stress and pressure at times, but I just try to take it a day at a time. Otherwise, it I just... Yeah, it gets overwhelming sometimes if I look at it, if I think about it too much. <laughs> right. Okay, one bite at a time. Eat the elephant one bite at a time. I love it. So I wanted to start, especially at the beginning of your story. Uh, I, I mentioned this in the intro, but you started out as a teacher and it overcame a work bully later. So let's talk about the beginning of your career, or what you thought would be your career in teaching and kind of lead us through your life. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So uh, actually, I went through an exercise when I was in business school where I looked at my life story and pulled out the different events that happened. And those really helped me to find find my purpose in life. And so the very first event begins at the age of 17, which kind of brought me to my teaching career. So when I was 17, my mom passed away from cancer. And as part of the healing process, I I didn't know what to do. So I instead of just crying all the time and being upset and being depressed, because it's not the type of person that I am, I instead looked for and reached for opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise done if that hadn't have happened. So I wanted to do things that would make my mom proud. And I ended up my senior year of high school taking a pre-calculus class and a physics class as my senior electives. (laughs) And while all my friends were taking like sewing and cooking class and, you know, fun things like that. And it really led to a love of math and science. I ended up going to college. I thought I wanted to start off as elementary education and then realizing that the competition was fierce for that level of teaching. I ended up switching my major my sophomore year to mathematics education, even though it's not something I'm naturally good at, but I knew that if I put you know, pen to paper and worked really hard that I could make it through the program. And I did. I made it through the program with a 3.0, which I was really proud of. And I learned from that experience that even through tragedy, you can find ways to grow from your experiences. It's always been my coping mechanism when dealing with hardships in my life. So that's how I got into teaching. Um, I love helping others. I love sharing my knowledge, bringing people together, helping them work together in a collaborative way. I used to do a lot of group activities with my students and learning games. And that was one thing that I always excelled at with my uh, teaching reviews that I received from administrators. But after a year and a half of teaching, I learned the not so um, fabulous side, I guess you could say, to the administration and the politics and the union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really realized that, you know, teaching is, it's not about the kids at all. It's about the union versus the administration and all of these, we'd have these crazy rallies after school and protests and it was all about the contracts and fighting with them and I, I don't know, it was just a side of the public education system that I had never been exposed to through being a student in the public education system and also through college, never learning about that in any of my classes. 
And when I saw that side of the education system, I realized that this was not the career for me. I did not want to be part of the drama. I didn't want to be fighting with people and battling parents and I don't know, just all the drama that comes along with it. So I actually was laid off from my teaching job because it was during the 2008-2009 school year, which is when the housing market crashed. And because I was first in, I was first out. And I spent the year of 2009 to 2010 unemployed trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So I was two years out of college, recently married, living in my mother-in-law's spare bedroom in her upstairs, unemployed, feeling like, you know, this is not what I envisioned my life to look like when I was walking across that commencement stage two years prior. And so I, I did some math tutoring. I considered changing careers. We ended up relocating to New Hampshire. My husband also got laid off from his job in New York City. So we were both unemployed living in his mom's spare bedroom. Like, thanks for kicking uh, us when we're down. Yeah. So it was, I mean, it was a rough year. And I know that a lot of people my age went through some really tough times between 2009 and 2010 and that I'm not alone. So we ended up relocating to New Hampshire and that's when I changed careers. I ended up switching over to the corporate side, the corporate world, and my husband joined a startup and started working for a startup. So that's how we ended up in New Hampshire. It's it's so crazy to me how much even the bad things really lead us down the path that we're supposed to be on. You know, I get yeah. asked a lot from people like, "Why did you quit teaching? You had a teaching career and you had a contract, a teaching job when a lot of people would have killed to have that. And I always go back to some of the same things you mentioned, the political red tape. I mean, obviously there was an incident that happened to me too, which if listeners haven't listened to my podcast on the story, you have to hear on why I quit teaching. They should check that out. But, you know, I always go back to, you know, it, it, like you said, so poignantly, it's not about the kids. You know, as a teacher, you are there because of the children. Like I miss working with the kids, but I've had to learn that there's other aspects and other ways that now that as an entrepreneur, I actually have more freedom to impact kids, you know, whether it's via volunteering in other classrooms or, you know, with the Union Gospel Mission here in town, there's, there's different avenues. So I just love that you, you shared that with us. So Mm -hmm. let's go to, you know, you went from New York to living in New Hampshire and you're working in corporate America. And that's when you encountered the work bully, correct? Yes. So this was my very first experience working in corporate. And my dad, has he's a, an electrical engineer, and he's worked in corporate his whole life. And he just always complains about his job. And it was actually pretty funny. When he was down here for Christmas this past year, and my aunt and uncle lived down here, they were over as well. We're all sitting around the dining room table, and my dad is like, you know, I'm celebrating 25 years at my job this year. And my aunt goes, wow, you've been, you've been miserable for 25 years now. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I love So like for me, like, you know, hearing my dad complain about his job, like I just was like, this is normal. Like that's how corporate is. Like Mm -hmm. people hate their jobs and people are mean to each other. And it's like, you know, an episode of the office or office, (laughs) (laughs) the movie. So I just thought it was normal. I, I really had no idea. I was, you know, what you call green because I was, I was 26 years old. I was fresh out of college. I had no experience in business. I had a teaching degree, not a business degree. I knew nothing about what I was doing, but they knew that I was open to learn and that I was driven, motivated, disciplined, and that I could figure it out. So I started off as a temp. I was a temporary employee making $14 an hour for the first eight months, which was a huge pay cut from my teacher's salary in New Jersey, but I did what I needed to do. And eventually got brought on full time. And uh, during this time, I, I really thought about going back to school. I knew that I always wanted to get an advanced degree. I knew in order to keep my teaching certification in the state of New York that I needed to have some sort of master's degree. Um, I'm certified in New York and New Jersey. New Jersey doesn't require that, but New York does. And so I was uh, speaking with someone about it. You know, there were really two influences that helped me make that decision. The first was um, I was with my husband for an internship 
back, this was back in, I think 2008 or 2009. And we were out to dinner with some of the team members at a conference that they were doing down in DC. They let me tag along for the weekend and help out at the booth. And we all went to dinner with the team that night. And one of the ladies at the table, she was older in her, you know, maybe 50s or 60s. And we were talking about going back to school. And she had her PhD. And she said, you have to go back to school. Once you have those letters, especially as a woman, no one can ever take those away from you. And I thought that was so powerful. I've always kept that with me. And then my other influence was my grandmother. She, um, at the time, back in, you know, the 1930s, 1940s, wanted to go to college. And she was the only female in the family. She had three brothers. And everyone in her family was like, no, a woman's place is not in school. You need to be a wife. You need to be a mother. You need to take care of the household. You know, this is the 1940s, 1950s. And she was very defiant. She was like, no, I'm going to school. I don't care what you guys say. (laughs) So she went to college and got her bachelor's degree. And then later in the 50s, started a family, got married, started a family, had three kids. She was a teacher, was was a stay-at-home mom, part-time stay-at-home mom, raised three kids, and she went to school at nighttime and got her master's degree in education. So she was also a huge influence, and I thought, you know, if she can do it, then I can do it. So I applied to go back to school. I studied for six months, did the GMAT before work, studied, and took the test, applied to school, got in, and then worked full-time while I went to school full-time at night. And it was the longest two years of my life, but it was the best two years of my life at the same time. It was it was hard and it challenged me, but I grew in so many different ways. And the one course that really impact me, impacted me was Leadership in the 21st Century with Dr. Carol Barnett. And I've interviewed her on my podcast. I actually like burst into tears when I saw her before we had to record. Aww. Her in two years since I'd graduated. So I took this course and, and realized what good leadership was and that I was in fact um, being led by a toxic leader in the work environment. So I call her the work bully. She made me feel like I was completely worthless. She would lock me in her glass office so that coworkers could hear and see what was happening and run down the list of all the things that were wrong with me. She threatened my career growth. She told me that everyone thought I was a bitch, and she told me that I needed to know my place in the hierarchy. Granted, it was a Swiss company, so there is that part of the culture that's inherent in the company, but she would tell me, you know, I'm up here and you're down here. You need to know your place and you need to stay there. So Mm -hmm. after five years of this, of this bullying, um, it took about, you know, until year three that I realized that it was actually happening, and then after year three, I was like, I okay, there's two options here. I can either try to change the culture and become an informal leader and change how she perceives me and treats me, or I have to leave because she's not going to change and this is only going to get worse. So I tried the first route for about a year and I really tried to change the way that she treated me and treated others and it didn't work. Um, The culture of the organization was too antithetical. So I ended up coming up with plan B, which was Style Collective. And eventually left. Um, it's about a little over two years now. So, yeah. <laughs> and when you left your corporate job, had you already started Style Collective, or was it something where you just had this in that kind of the back pocket of your mind, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to quit, and then start Style Collective? How did that transition work? Yeah. So I would definitely advise anyone listening if you are in a situation where you're not happy. Don't just leave and then start something. You have to start it on the side. You have to hustle. You have to validate the idea and make sure that it's going to work because the worst thing that's going to happen is that you leave your job and you start a business and then you blow through all your savings and you're still not making money and you're going to feel so much pressure to make money. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, if I was going to start a business that I was going to do it right. I was going to really get to know people within the industry. I knew nothing about influencer marketing. I had taken a social media class during my, my, um, 
MBA program and that kind of got my foot in the door. So I, I made it my mission to learn the industry, get to know other people in the industry. I started my own blog. I started monetizing my own blog and I just figured it out and tried to find what people needed. I realized that there was this opportunity for community to bring people together and to also educate them, to take my teaching skills and use them in a different way for a group of people that needed, needed to be, you know, have this education around this new emerging industry. So I worked on it at nighttime. I worked on it, you know, during my lunch break, before work, I worked on it for a year. And the group of girls that I really got to know and became, you know, the founding members, I call them the founding members of Style Collective. I, there were 65 of them in a Facebook group. I put together a whole business proposal and I did a formal presentation to all of them on a Google Hangout and said, this is my idea for Style Collective. I want to turn it into a business. I want to make it affordable, $10 a month, $99 a year, because right now all I see are just e-courses that cost $500. And while I'm sure that they're great and they bring incredible value, I know that I can't afford them because I just got out of business school and I have $50,000 of student loan debt. So I want to create something for millennial women that's a little more accessible, that still is high quality and high value. And they loved the idea. They were so supportive and they're like, yes, yes, do it. Turn, make, Let's have the best boss babe community ever. Like, oh my God, I'm so excited. And so with their support, they helped build up my confidence to launch it as a business. And yeah, that's how it started. So I would definitely say like I, I worked on it while I was trying to plan my exit. And, you know, if it was up to me, I, I wanted, I stayed as long as I possibly could, as long as I possibly could until I literally could not take it anymore. And I dreaded waking up and getting out of bed in the morning. And I would sit at my table in the morning crying my eyes out because I didn't want to go to work mm -hmm. and I didn't want to face that woman. And so when it finally got to that point, then I was like, it's enough. I can't take it anymore. I just have to leave. Like anything other than this is going to be better. Yes. <laughs> so that required such a leap of faith on your part. I mean, obviously you had this idea and you were building the foundations for Style Collective on the backside. But if you were to give one piece of advice to other women that are looking to make a similar leap of faith, you know, whether it's leaving a job or, or even just starting something new on the side, what would that piece of advice be? Okay, so I am type A and I'm a planner. And I I mapped it out. I mean, I waited until the last possible minute and I hung on until the bitter end, which, you know, in hindsight, I kind of wish I hadn't have done that because I really tortured myself by trying to stick it out and I mm -hmm. didn't want to give up my paycheck and go into this unforbidden, like un you know, unforeseen territory of entrepreneurship <laughs> because I had seen my husband struggle at a startup. He was there for five years and it wasn't profitable. And I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. But for me, it got to the point where it was do or die. So I sat down and I got real with myself. And I listened to a lot of Tim Ferriss podcasts. I read his book, The 4-Hour Work Week. I see you shaking your head. you big fan yeah. too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I took his advice and put, you know, really put pen to paper and thought, what is the worst possible thing that is going to happen? What are these fears that I have? And if I write them down and actually look at them on paper, they're not so bad. You know, it's me building it up in my head and creating a lot of anxiety because it's a change and it's different. It's uncharted territory. But once I put it down on paper, it wasn't that scary. Once I looked at it in a more logical, non-emotional way, try to remove the emotion, then I saw, okay, I'll try this for six months. And if it doesn't work, the worst possible scenario is that I just go back out and I find another job. I added some new skills to my resume. I gave it a shot. At least I can say that I tried. I spent some of my savings, but it's money. You can recoup it. It's not the end of the world. As long as I didn't go into debt or anything like that, then I was fine with it. So 
I think for anyone who's thinking about starting out, I would highly recommend sitting down and really spending some time with yourself. Why are you doing this? Um, what, is there something that you can do to help other people? Is there a skill that you have that's valuable that other people need? Is there a story that happened in your life that you could tell and inspire others to take action in their life? As long as you have something of value that you are going to be providing to someone, then I think you should sit down and really weigh out the pros and cons of staying where you are or making that leap of faith and turning it into a business. Because no matter what you do, you're going to go through the dip, right? The dip is where you take that leap of faith and like your income drops and like plummets. Like, what, the, what did I just <laughs> and do? Like build it back up and then get to a stable place. And it, and it will take a while. I have to say that, you know, going through the dip for me was about two years. Sorry about that. Um, it was about two years before I could finally start paying myself again after coming from a steady paycheck and steady income. So that was, that was hard, but I would say for someone to sit down and make that list and, and weigh the pros and cons and decide if it's worth it. I love that. And that definitely shows that you're a type A person. You're like, let's weigh the pros and the cons. (laughs) (laughs) For me, it took my husband just saying, you know, you don't have to teach just because you have a degree in it. Right. And I was like, Hmm. Mm -hmm what? <laughs> like, you know, cause I came from a similar background and just everybody in my life had been telling me, Oh, you got your degree in education. Like, this is what you should do. Like put your head down, work, 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 and then you can retire. And it, you know, it reminded me of what you said about your dad. Like, Hey, I've been at my job for 25 years. And you're like, and your was it your aunt that said, Oh, you've been my miserable aunt. for 25 years. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I kept envisioning was like, wait, I have to work for 30 plus years just to enjoy life at the end. <laughs> like, yeah, that doesn't make I sense. Know. So I, I know, love that piece of advice sense. about, you know, <laughs> taking that leap of faith and, and really finding your why. I mean, again, Tim Ferriss talks about this a lot in his podcast, which we'll talk about later with um, other resources, but Simon Sinek's book, The Find Your Why, it really mm-hmm. reminds me of that. Did you read that book start as well? Why. Yeah, start with yes. why. I actually, I usually keep it on my desk, but <laughs> I just put it back on the bookshelf. Yes, I love that book. <laughs> yeah, I, it's on my reading list because right now I'm working through the four-hour work week with Tim Ferriss. So it's on the next <laughs> next item in my, my to-do list, I guess. Um, yes, and I also think like another thing that you said is like I had this perception after college that I was going to have the same career for the rest of my life because that, you know, my dad has had the same career for the rest of his life. But our generation is so different and our careers are not linear. And everything, every experience that you have, every skill that you've gained and piece of knowledge that you've gained over the years, it all leads to something new and something different. Like I, you know, people, I got asked one time in an interview do you wish that you had started Style Collective after college? And I said, no, absolutely not. Like I needed to go through everything that I went through to have all of the skills to be able to create this business. Like I needed to be a teacher. I needed to go through the work bully situation to find out that I really valued compassion and empathy and bringing people together in a community type of space in order, and, you know, and then the business too, like going back to school and getting my MBA, like I needed to go through all of these things to get to where I am now. So I'm a big believer in the saying that everything happens for a reason because it does. I really think that it does. Absolutely. And I think you just had a podcast drop this week and you and your guests talked a lot about everything happening for a reason. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I was listening to it yesterday. <laughs> yes, Alex. Yeah, yes, the perfect yes. thing here. Love yeah. her. Yeah, that was a really good episode. So if my listeners haven't listened to that one, head over to Annie's <laughs> podcast after this one, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about your work in like the influence world and style and fashion industry. So before you... I'm, I'm trying to figure this out in my head as far as like timeline. Had you started your Chloe and Isabel business while still working style collective or how did that work? And so for my listeners that aren't familiar with Chloe and Isabel, it's a jewelry company and it's a, I hate to call it like an, it's not an MLM like multi-level marketing company, but mm-hmm. they have. It's just direct merch- sales. You get a yeah. commission. Yeah. Yeah. And they so have uh, rather like they than merchandisers all- rather than like. Um, join my team. It's like, it's actual merchandisers for the company. So tell me a little bit about that (laughs) and how you were able to leverage your jewelry marketing and your not marketing, but merchandising with style collective. 
Yes. So this was three years ago. Um, if I had started my blog and I was trying to figure out what I was doing because I had no idea. <laughs> and <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing three years ago. So I had this idea as a way to monetize my blog that I, because I liked fashion, I was like, what if I use this jewelry company to add the, some pieces to my outfit and style my outfit and then I could sell the jewelry through my Instagram. And really what got me is when I went onto the, I forget how I found out about Chloe and Isabel, but it was pretty shortly after they had just started up. And I went onto their about page and I was reading about their mission and their values and like who the, um, the optimal Chloe and Isabel merchandiser was. And I just got so excited. I was like, yes, this is me. They're speaking to me. This is me. This is the type of person that I am. I want to be a merchandiser. And so at the time you had to apply and you went through a phone interview. And then I heard back that I was approved to join as a merchandiser. And so I just took it and I hit the ground running. I had this idea to pitch a local fashion boutique in Portsmouth, New Hampshire that had just recently opened up. And she carried a lot of incredible brands like Trina Turk, Rebecca Taylor, Rebecca Minkoff, Nicole Miller, a lot of high-end brands. And so I I analyzed the jewelry that she sold in her store. I did some stalking. <laughs> and <laughs> I put together an entire business proposal showing the gaps in her merchandising strategy and how Chloe and Isabel could fill those gaps and create a price point that was accessible that would add, you know, that someone could style and add to the clothing that she was selling in her store. And in exchange for letting me sell the Chloe and Isabel jewelry on her store shelves where she was already getting foot traffic, I would in turn give her consulting services and I would draw from my experiences in um, the company that I was working for had 60 retail stores and I was in charge of many different things from product development to marketing and merchandising and all that kind of stuff. So I took my knowledge from there and said, I'll help you get you know, with your events, I'll help you get more people in the store, I'll help you with your marketing and your cross promotions with local businesses to get the awareness out there of your store since it's a pretty new store in the area. So I did that for a year. And then I also sold the Chloe and Isabel through my blog. And at the same time, that's when I started to get to know other bloggers. I was that's when like loop giveaways started to become popular back I think this was back in 2015. And I, I started organizing them to get to know other bloggers and help us grow our following. I was selling the Chloe and Isabel through my blog. I remember I had 500 followers on Instagram and somehow people found me and they were buying jewelry. I remember I sold like $1,000 of jewelry in one month and I only had 500 followers. <laughs> so to me, yeah, that was like my first taste of blogging and social media and monetizing my blog through in-person consulting services and then also through uh, personal styling through my blog. I styled a lot of my friends and some of my readers and helped them get ready for big life events like weddings or, or things like that. So I started the blog first and then got to know other influencers as I was building my influence and then realized like, wow, this is an incredible community of women and none of us know what we're doing. Wouldn't it be great if we had some e-courses on this? <laughs> some, some leadership in that. I love that. So that's what kind of fueled the starting of Style Collective? Mm-hmm. Yep. I love it. So for my listeners that aren't really familiar with Style Collective, I know, especially I'm in the Northwest, you're on the East Coast. It's not as like prevalent around here, especially where I live. There's not a lot of style bloggers. And if you could explain essentially in like an elevator pitch, what Style Collective is and how it helps other style influencers, bloggers, what have you, would you do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Terrible okay, way of so... asking the question, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's an influencer community for, it's a platform for influencers to connect, grow, and learn how to be successful bloggers and entrepreneurs. And we do that through our online community, our e-courses, the education that we have. Um, and then we also have in-person events as well where we bring people together at our annual conference. We have our first one coming up in April in Raleigh, North Carolina. And then at New York Fashion Week, we have events too. I've done events at Swim Week and 
traveled a lot last year and met a lot of people in person. But yeah, so that's basically it's community education for influencers. And um, it is one of the largest online platforms for that for the community and education. I love it. I was so excited when you opened the doors again for membership. And I (laughs) immediately joined. I was like, I've been wanting to join this for a while. And it even led to my finding out about a, a style conference that was over in Seattle just a couple weekends ago. And as soon as I found out about it through Style Collective, I was like, I'm going. So I went and I met so many amazing, not only influencers and bloggers in the fashion industry, but I made amazing connections with retail brands and companies based out of Seattle, like Nordstrom. And it's just, it was a I great love conference that. that I got to attend and I wouldn't have known about it if it hadn't been for Style Collective. <laughs> well, thank you to whoever put that on the calendar. I have yeah. to go back and look. <laughs> it might have been our regional leader here in the yeah. Northwest, but anyway, mm-hmm. I just love that. Now, I forgot a question that I wanted to ask, and it was all based around the, the Chloe and Isabel starting, but I wanted to know, are there other ways that women that might be listening that have their own side hustle, whether it's like a Rodan and Fields business at home, Mary Kay, anything like that, where they're kind of trying to build their own, yeah, like side hustle. Is there any way that they can learn from your experience with using Chloe and Isabel and use that to leverage their own, you know, side money? Okay, sure. So... One of the things that I did while I was starting my blog was I read a lot of books. I read the book Start With Why, which helps you find your your purpose and communicating your purpose to of a vision of a world that doesn't yet exist. And then people who share this world worldview with you will follow your lead and take action in their lives based on this this purpose that you have, this view that you have of the world. And then another book that I have, which is on my desk because I've been referencing it a lot lately, is All Marketers Tell Stories by Seth Godin. And this is another book that I read as well. And it's really powerful. It says the underground classic that explains how marketing really works and why authenticity is the best marketing of all. So I read this and it's all about telling your story. It's not about um, sharing the bet about the benefits or the quality or the cost or like these things that people don't care about. People connect on stories So that's the most important thing when you are trying to do direct sales. Like nobody wants to receive a DM saying, I'd love for you to join my team. Like nobody cares. It's annoying. Okay. So have you tried it? It works yet? Like, (laughs) yeah, no, it doesn't work. It works. It does not work, I guess. To, it doesn't work for getting people to join your team because we don't want to hear it. So I think it's really important to figure out like, why are you selling these items? What is the story that you're telling about these items that other people can be like, Hey, that's me too. And like, feel really excited about the story that you're telling, because that's what is going to create. That's what's going to convert. That's how you're going to gain sales by telling stories about the items. Like, for example, I have this ring on my finger. It's a David Yerman ring and it's this aqua blue stone. And the story that I tell myself about this ring is that when I was younger, my mom had this big blue topaz. It was like a teardrop shaped ring from QVC. Mm -hmm. It was like one of those fake gaudy rings, but (laughs) I loved it and it was her favorite ring and she wore it all the time. And I've always wanted like David Muirman jewelry, what girl doesn't. And on the 15 year anniversary of my mom passing away, I told my husband that I really, I wanted a David Muirman ring. I'd wanted one forever and I wanted it to be blue topaz because that was the color of the ring that my mom would wear all the time when I was growing up and I loved that color. So, you know, if I was trying to sell this ring to someone, that's the story that I would tell. I would tell the story about how this reminds me of my mom, that my husband bought it for me as an anniversary gift for the 15-year milestone of my mom passing away. And I look at it every day, and I think of her, and I keep her with me in everything that I do. So those are the stories that people connect with, and they, they feel emotion when they hear something like that. And they really... They like you, they empathize, they want to be your friend. And and that's how you can sell, that's how you sell something. You make those authentic connections with people just by telling your story, by being open and being real, being vulnerable. And it is scary, but once you start doing it and practicing it, 
it comes very naturally. I love that. Well, and I think it's so important to remember that in today's world where everything is shown through a filter, you know, everyone mm-hmm. is seeing perfect pictures on Instagram and it's like, oh, this person has this perfect life and we forget that they're a real person underneath the the feed and the pictures and there's raw emotions happening and, you know, feel, I feel like people are afraid to show that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a facade. And I think the people that are being that are successful and are seeing success in 2018 are the ones who are tearing down that facade and sharing the real side of themselves, the struggles along with the, you know, the highs that they're going through. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a great tip, especially for women that are listening that might have that side hustle and they're, you know, struggling with getting the sales or converting those friends into potential customers. So mm-hmm. I love that. Um, mm-hmm. so I did want to ask, you know, as we mentioned earlier, you have a style conference coming up. Tell me a little bit more <laughs> about that and what's going to be included in that amazing conference coming up in April. Yes, I know. I'm so excited. And I feel like I've just been working on it nonstop. And I feel like I'm finally like coming out for for air. But because the sun I'm, out? Oh, I haven't noticed because I've been yeah. inside all the time. <laughs> like, oh my God, did I eat today? <laughs> <laughs> but the conference is awesome. It's in Raleigh, North Carolina. It is for bloggers, female bloggers. Um, It is going to be two days of empowerment and learning and connecting with others. We are having influencer panels, brand panels, and then there's going to be four workshops. We actually are getting a workbook. It's a 70-page workbook, and you'll appreciate this, Deirdre. Um, It has worksheets in it and note sheets for everyone to take notes, and it's the workshops are going to be hands-on. It's not going to be a conference where you're sitting there and absorbing information and hearing about how someone grew their following eight years ago when they started blogging. It's all girls that are going to be sharing up-to-date information. And the workshops are all about, I'm teaching um, one about building your brand and developing your authentic leadership as an influencer because influencers are leaders and you have to be a leader in order to grow and be successful as an influencer. The second workshop is being taught by my team member, Jesse, and it's going to be content planning. So you're going to plan out your entire 2018 content calendar and all of your subject lines, your headlines that convert. And then on day two is going to be a um, media media workshop, uh, leveling up your media outreach and your brand sponsorships. And then the other workshop will be with my friend Courtney. It's all about podcasting, (laughs) how to start a podcast, how to make it to the top 10, because she does have a podcast that's in the, it's like usually in the top five, top five, um, I mean, top five or top 10 in the health and wellness category. So that's amazing. Yeah. She's she's killing it. (laughs) (laughs) I guess so. I love that. Well, where can people find out more information about Style Conference? Yeah. So it's Style Collective Conference. It's stylecollective.us backslash conference. And that's where you can buy your tickets. Love it. Love it. So (laughs) speaking of the conference and podcasting, why did you start the Becoming Fearless podcast? Like where did that come about? Okay. So I had my blog which was originally a fashion and lifestyle blog. And then I rebranded it as just my name, like AnnieSpano.com. And I started writing about deeper topics and the things that I wanted to connect with people on a, di- on a deeper level and have them get to know a more personal side of me, the things that I believe in, the things that I stand for, my perspective on leadership and being a values-driven leader. And I was writing these really deep blog posts on my blog, but no one was really reading them, to be honest. Oh. Because, yeah, you know, people are, they do better with audio, audio and video. And I knew this. It's easier to connect that way. It is. And it's easier to pop on a podcast while you are driving or at the gym or cooking dinner or just multitasking. It's a lot harder to pull out your phone and read a blog post while you're, you're trying to drive, you know, I would not advise that you do. (laughs) No blogging and driving everyone. (laughs) No reading and driving. Yeah. Oh my God. So 
um, I decided, you know, that a podcast, I was going to try it out and see if that would be a better medium for connecting with people. I like speaking better than writing. Writing is not something that comes naturally to me. I have to work really hard on my writing, but interviewing people, connecting with them, sharing different perspectives and sharing my story through an audio medium was a lot easier and a lot more natural for me, especially being a teacher and being at the front of the classroom. I loved being at the front of the classroom and teaching others. So it just felt like a natural medium to get into. And it's, yeah, that's, so that's why I started it because I wanted to connect with others and share my story and my perspective. And I, it wasn't really working on the blog, but it, it works on the podcast and everyone, you know, I receive DMS and messages and reviews and feedback and emails and, you know, sometimes these emails lead to phone calls or podcasts together <laughs> like we're doing right now. And, and, and I love the medium. I think it's it's brought me a lot of happiness and joy. And I, I think that it's really helped a lot of people and inspired them to, to take action in their lives. So with podcasting, what has been your favorite interview to date that you've been the interviewer asking questions? I would have to say the interview with my leadership professor, because for me, that was that was like a full circle moment where the last time I had seen her was in 2014 at my graduation ceremony. And when I took the leadership class from her and she gave me the tools for my toolbox and then I went out and I took action. She is the one who empowered me to start style collective, even though she didn't know it, you know, she was just doing her job as her, as a professor and, and following the curriculum and, and showing us the way of leadership. So I went out and, and I followed it all and I took action. And then when I saw her last year, so this is 2017, three years later, and I got to sit down and tell her about what I started that I left I left behind the work bully and I started a company that empowers women and shows them how to be leaders and be authentic to themselves. And I've taken the tools that she's given to me and I'm now giving them to influencers. And that for me was just like one of my favorite moments of my recent, you know, the recent past being able to tell her how much she impacted me. And now I'm taking that message and helping other women as a result. And I was crying, as I said before, <laughs> I, was, I, like, I like lost it when I saw her because she's like, you know, the one that motivated me to take action. So yeah, that, that was my favorite interview because she goes over the leadership principles and the framework that she taught in the leadership class that I took. And so that's, the, you know, the framework that changed my life. So I, I love that interview. I specifically remember that interview because I think I reached out to you after hearing it because I could tell the passion and your love for that woman through your voice on the podcast. And as oh. soon as I heard that, and I think that's when I reached out to you via Instagram and I DM'd you and I was like, Hey, I just want to let you know, like I just heard this podcast and I could just tell you're so passionate and that you had such a, a, a huge respect for her and I can you mm -hmm. could hear it through your voice and I think that's what's important especially nowadays you know with so many ways that people can influence whether it's via podcast videos blogs whatever having that genuine voice and coming through with that it can be hard to to let people in and hear that in your tonality your vulnerability and so just I want to say kudos to you for being open and vulnerable on that that podcast Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> and actually all your podcasts, I mean, it's, it's not easy to necessarily open up and share about, you know, overcoming a work bully, or I think it might've been yesterday's podcast I was listening to from you, where you talked about how some people were giving you a hard time and saying, Oh, you talk about the work bully like too much. Yes. And so tell me a little bit about that and how you've been able to overcome <laughs> some of those naysayers. Yeah, uh, it's definitely interesting being an influencer and having to deal with the negativities that comes along with it or the copycats as well that come along with it. Um, I think 
I, I think that like I, I know my story and I know my purpose. And I would say for anyone listening, like your biggest asset is your story and speaking your truth, like how you've done speaking your truth about why you left teaching and what you went through. And that empowers people and makes them feel like they're not alone, that someone else went through this and they survived and they took action. They did something different that was really scary. But, you know, maybe I can do that, too. This other person did it. So so maybe I can do this as well. And maybe I can do that thing that I've always wanted to do. And I don't have to stay here and be miserable. So I think that even though there are people that they get sick of hearing it or they copy you because they see what you're doing and then they just try to do it in like their own inauthentic way because they see you being successful or what they perceive as successful, like I, you just have to take it with a grain of salt. You know, I just look at those, those experiences and say, I don't know what that person is thinking, what they are in security that they're projecting outwards towards me, but I just have to do me. I know my purpose. I know my story. I know my mission and my vision for what I'm trying to create and what I'm working towards constantly. And I just have to move forward. I love that especially, you know, finding your story. And I've heard this said before, like your mess is your message. And another part of my story that I tell a lot is how I overcame insomnia. So I don't know if you knew that, but Mm. at my worst, I was only sleeping like one, two hours a day. And, and then there was weight gain on top of that because my adrenals and my cortisol levels were all out of whack, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being in those moments and like people were really mean, like this one girl that I had known through pageantry actually. And maybe she was just trying to, I don't know, get up in my face about stuff, but she (laughs) sent me a private message on Facebook after I'd put somebody tagged me in a photo and I was obviously like at my heaviest, like 40 pounds heavier than what she'd ever known me as through pageants. And she was like, Hey, I just want to say you look great. Are you glowing for a reason? Like, are you expecting? And I was like, are you serious? I barely oh know God. you. And you're, tell- you're asking me this on Facebook Messenger, what I'm expecting? And I was like, you're just asking me that. Like, my husband was like, well, I don't get it. That sounds really nice. And I was like, no, that's girl code. No. That goes against girl code. Like, you don't ask somebody if they're pregnant just because you think they're... It's, a, it's like trying to say, oh, you're fat, but I don't want to ask. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> Oh, so anyway, I hear you. Like, it's important to talk about these things because (laughs) other people go through them too. Mm -hmm. And like, it's actually really crazy this week. I don't know if you follow Jenna Kutcher. Do you follow her? I get her ads, like her ads pop up on my stuff. So I must be her, her ideal client, but I don't actually follow her. Okay. So she, um, posted this post on her Instagram last week, like mid last week. And it was a picture of her and her husband walking on the beach. And he has, you know, she's a curvy girl and her husband has a six pack and he's ripped. And so she wrote this post on her Instagram saying, you know, one time someone slid into my DMs and said, you know, I don't, how do you feel about like being curvy and your husband has a six pack? Like, it's kind of weird. You, maybe you don't deserve him type of thing. Oh my god. And gosh. So she talked about that in her Instagram post, like how she really struggles with feeling like she's not good enough and she tries to be body positive, but she has a lot of insecurities with being a curvy girl and being married to someone who looks like a model essentially. Mm-hmm. And this post it went viral. It got picked up by Yahoo and Fox News and like major media outlets. And I've literally watched her gain like 60,000 influence, 60,000 followers in the last like two to three days because of all this exposure that she got uh, from that post. So it just goes to show you like the power of a story and speaking your truth and sharing those vulnerabilities because other people, you know, everyone's come just thousands of comments on this picture of people being like, I feel the same way too. Thank you so much for sharing this story. It's so great to know that I'm not alone. And you know, Mm -hmm. that's what connects people. And that's, that's what's needed in the online space. So if you have a story, you have an insecurity, you have something, a hardship that you overcame it, you know, just don't be afraid to share it. People need to hear it. And that's how you connect. And that's how you grow your influence. Absolutely. I know. And that's actually my 
platform now as Mrs. Washington is I took that message of, you know, health and healing and shared it. Cause at first I was scared to admit it and tell people like, Hey, I was hooked on antidepressants because I was so miserable and I was 40 pounds overweight. But if I can inspire just one person to start taking control of their health, like then that whole struggle was worth it for me. And that's when I had mm-hmm. to like start sharing that <laughs> with other people, even though mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of scary, but you know, it's um, scary, but I'm so happy that you do share that. I'm sure that there's people that have reached out to you and been like, Oh, I finally, like, I feel like I found the answer because you, t- you were talking about this and I didn't know that, you know, I, I thought I was all alone. Yeah, no, it's definitely like open up my heart because people will sometimes send me those kind of messages. They're like, Hey, I heard your podcast about da 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 or your Facebook live where you opened up about this issue that you're struggling with. And I just like, it really spoke to me. And like, that's what, you know, encourages me to keep sharing because sometimes I do get that negative kickback or even from like friends and family that are supposed to be my loved ones that encourage that. Sometimes they'll say things like, I think you're being a little too open and raw and and on social media and, or on your podcast and you like rein it in a little bit. I'm like, well, thanks for your opinion, but thanks for your feedback. (laughs) That's what I say. Thanks for your feedback, (laughs) but I'm going to keep doing me, you know, anyway. Well, I think, one of the, I just, one last thing. Yeah. I read this article. It was recommended by Tim Ferriss. It's called 1000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. And it's this article. You can just Google it. 1000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. And it's Check this principle out. that you don't need to be a mega influencer to make a good living. You literally need 1000 true diehard fans that will buy anything from you. And you can make a decent living. So if you're a songwriter you sell a thousand CDs or a thousand digital CDs, I guess, or you're a book writer and you sell a thousand books, you can then go on a book tour. So it, it, the whole concept is that it makes entrepreneurship feel a little less overwhelming and daunting because if you just focus on that building your tribe of a thousand mm-hmm. people, that if you offer a product such as Chloe and Isabel or one of those direct sales companies that you work for, or if you have a service that you want to offer, like a styling service or a blog consulting service, whatever, social media. If you have 1,000 people that are like dying to buy something from you because you've formed that personal connection with them, you've shared your story with them, and they know you on a deeper, intimate level, and they look to you for that insight or that inspiration that you're providing, like you can make a living. You don't need to have millions of followers to make a living on social media. So like that was another article that I read when I was, you know, thinking about the idea of Style Collective, like, all right, if I can just get to a thousand members, then I'll be good. I could do this for the rest of my life. I don't need to reach millions of people. I don't need to have a mega business. I don't need to be the next Apple or whatever to be successful and find happiness. So I think that's really important too. It goes back to sharing your story with people. That's such a great piece of information. I'm definitely going to have to look up that resource. So that actually leads me into some of my questions that I ask all my listeners, or all my guests, excuse me. So my first Mm -hmm. one is, what are your top three core values that dictate all your decisions? Okay, uh, so the first one is integrity. I make sure that everything I do comes back to integrity. I don't ever, I always try to lead from heart. I'm not in this, not in business to make money off of people or scam them or work with a brand that would never align with me. Everything comes back to integrity. And as a leader, it needs to be one of your core values. Uh, The other is compassion, which I learned from the work bully. She taught me how important it is to have compassion for others because Mm. that was quality that she did not have. So I learned that. Um, And then growth. I learned from my mom passing away that no matter what situation you go through, um, a negative situation such as losing a parent at the age of 17, there's always an opportunity for growth and light. And it's just what you make of it. Hmm, I love those. Honesty is a big one for me too. <laughs> mm. Like you said, I, I think it comes down to every entrepreneur if you're in it for the right reasons and, and mm-hmm. integrity. Um, what does it mean? And this is something that I ask everyone that's like very open to interpretation, but 
What does it mean to you to do things with style and grace? So I think that style and grace is another way of saying that you need to know your values and principles, your guiding principles in life. What is your story? What are the things that have shaped the person that you've become and the things that you believe in so strongly and passionately that you have to broadcast out to the world? It's speaking your truth, telling your story, and then empowering others to do the same in their lives. Oh, I love that. That's such a great piece of information. And that's a direction that nobody else has actually taken that question. <laughs> so I always love to like make sure people understand, like you can go any way with this. It doesn't have to go style and fashion and go whatever route you want to go. So yeah. <laughs> so where can my listeners find you? I know we talked about where to find information on the style conference that's coming up in April, but on all the other avenues, where can my listeners stalk you in a good way? Yes. Uh, so Style Collective is stylecollective.us. That's the website. If you want to check out the podcast, you can look it up in iTunes. It's called the Becoming Fearless Podcast. And then if you want to come stalk me on social media, slide into my DMs and say hi, <laughs> you can find me at Annie underscore Spano or Style Collective underscore. Love it. That's so Great. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom. I feel like I could keep talking for hours, but I don't want uh, to <laughs> take up too much of your time. I know you're a busy boss, babe. So I love that. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. I'm truly honored. And I love that, you know, I get to share my story with you and connect with you. And, and hopefully your listeners got some valuable information and inspiration from our conversation today. So thank you for creating this space for other women and inspiring others to go after their dreams and their goals. Hey ladies, thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed today's episode. To help empower more women, please be a doll and rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes and other free resources we mentioned today, go to stylebydeidra.com.